I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate the time. I'm sorry we had to uh, unfortunately move the time back, uh, but to be respectful for the memorial that was happening here on campus. Uh, so we are kind of wrapping up a three-day tour. Uh, we spoke at Princeton on Monday at Dartmouth last night. Uh, and then I'll be heading to Kansas next week, uh, visiting the University of Kansas Benedictine, and a Kansas fan. Uh, and then I'll be going to Southern California, USC, UC Irvine, and continuing this tour in the spring. And I know some of the statements I'll make tonight uh, may be controversial. They certainly were last night in Dartmouth. So we'd love to have questions uh, from you after I finish my presentation. Um, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, and how um, I kind of came to this work, why I am the way I am. I grew up in a small town in West Virginia uh, with my parents and my younger sister. I was raised by um, a wonderful family, um, but my family, uh, like many families, uh, had certainly had its share of challenges. My father was raised by a mostly single mother, um, lived in poverty his whole life, uh, thankfully, graduated high school, uh, got a good paying blue collar job uh, after graduation, met my mother, uh, and then got married. And um, my father, actually I was thinking about him uh, the other day because he's going to be retiring pretty soon. He, his 60th birthday is uh, coming up in a month. Hopefully my mom's not watching or my dad's not watching. Um, and he's going to be retiring and he's super excited about this opportunity. He's been working 40 years at a job that he, he really never enjoyed. Uh, and when I think about why I am the way I am and why I strive for perfection and uh, why I'm always pushing myself, I always think about my dad and the conversations that he and I would have uh, going back and forth to uh, volleyball practice, basketball games, uh, softball tournaments, uh, him always pushing me. Uh, going to college wasn't something he hoped I would do. It was an understanding that I would do that. And it was also an understanding that I would get a full ride too. Uh, that he wouldn't be paying for it, that I'd be paying for it. Um, having a career was something that was always understood. And when I think about those conversations that he and I we used to have, you know, he always talked about how he wanted my life to be different than his life. That he wanted me to be able to have choices uh, and be able to do something that I want to get up every morning and do uh, and to love uh, my career. I also knew though I, I wanted to get married and I wanted to have kids. Now I always thought maybe I'd have like one kid or two kids. I'd now have four and I'm trying to pass my husband so we can have a fifth but uh, hey honey. Um, uh, but you know I always saw my mom kind of hustling from uh, home to work, back home to church. She was the first woman, first, first person in our house awake every morning, the last one to go to sleep, um, always doing everything to make sure that we had what we needed for school, that we had dinner in the crock pot when we came home, if she had to work late. Um, I knew it would be hard, but it's something that I, I wanted to do. And I think if you have asked me in high school, and if you have asked me in college, you know, do you consider yourself a feminist? I would have replied with an enthusiastic, hell yeah. Um, I never felt that my gender of uh, being female held me back. I was top of my class. I graduated valedictorian. Um, we had some vicious competitions in trigonometry and, and you know, calculus and, you know, who uh, had the highest GPA. Um, but I knew I was equal to my male peers. It, so it never really occurred to me or I didn't have thought about that, you know, be, because I'm female, I felt, I would feel that I was being held back. Um, but today at 32, uh, I don't know if I would call myself that. If I, I don't even know if I would want that label of, of feminism. Um, I think that my life is a pretty good testament to what the first wave and the second wave of feminists, of suffragists fought for, of what they envisioned for women in our country. I, um, I run an organization of 40 some employees. Uh, we're a six million dollar a year organization. Um, I work outside of the home. I frequently travel alone by myself without a chaperone. Um, I own, my name is on the deed of our home. Um, I vote in every election I can. 
my husband is now a stay-at-home dad. He homeschools our children. Uh, I'm unsuccessfully, I was trying to homeschool some times tables before this uh, began. Um, I'm the primary breadwinner. We have kind of an unconventional uh, family. So I, I think that when you think about feminism and women's equality, like I've totally benefited. Uh, and I think I, my life is a testament to what those first and second uh, generation of feminists envisioned for women. Um, but I'm not really welcome in the mainstream feminist movement. Um, it's not something of, oh yeah, of course Kristen Hawkins is a feminist. We'd love to have her. And it's always over you know, one simple issue. And that's the issue of abortion, the violent act of abortion. This was demonstrated perfectly at the Women's March this January. Um, right after President Trump's election, women online decided they wanted to march uh, against basically everything Trump uh, in Washington. Uh, and it was supposed to be a uniting march for women, uh, women speaking out. And I actually emailed, uh, Facebook actually, Facebook messaged the uh, co-founder of the Women's March and said, hey, we'd like to sponsor this. I think it'd be a really cool uh, opportunity uh, to show unity. Uh, for pro-life women, we represent the majority of women in America who are morally opposed to abortion. Uh, those Facebook messages went unanswered. Uh, a couple of my friends who have uh, organizations with the word feminist in the title, but not like for life like ours, <coughs> was a pretty obvious giveaway. Um, they had applied to be like co-sponsors of the march. They were actually accepted, put on the website, and then we were in a, an Atlantic article um, and we were quoted as being pro-life women leaders who were planning to be at the march and all of a sudden my friend's organizations were suddenly removed from the website and the Women's March came out a week before the march with this di very, very diverse platform uh, telling people like me that we weren't welcome, that uh, they were unequivocally for abortion in all nine months. Uh, they were unapologetically pro-abortion. Planned Parenthood was admitted as the platinum sponsor. And in fact, if you were there, you saw on the main stage, there was only one organization's logo, most of the time behind all the speakers, and that was Planned Parenthood's uh, logo. They, they made sure to capitalize on this march in Washington. But we were there. We went there anyway. We had a 20-foot banner that said abortion betrays women. Uh, we were there, we marched at the front of the March for Life, the March for Life, the Women's March for several blocks uh, before the older women in the march figured out that all these young women weren't actually uh, pro-abortion and then started trying to physically assault our teenage girls. Um, but we were there. We stood after um, we got ourselves out of the march, we stood on the side of Constitution Avenue as the march passed us by, and we were there for those women. Uh, those young women who have been told their whole lives, uh, women my age, who have been told that we need abortion, that in order to succeed in the workplace, women have to have abortion. I mean, the Supreme Court has even told us this, this, Casey v. Planned Parenthood, 1994. We were there for those women who were hurting from a past abortion, those women who were holding their anti-Trump or whatever sign they were holding, and would look up, see our abortion betrays banner, nod their heads and kind of look down. We wanted to be there for the majority of women who know that abortion does not equal female empowerment, that abortion does not make us, make us equal. And you know, I wasn't invited to speak or anything at the Women's March uh, convention that happened two weeks ago in Detroit, but we were there as well. We wanted to be there to show the women entering that, that convention that was bought and paid for by Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood's sponsorship was everywhere, uh, that we still are the voice for women in our nation, that the majority of women, poll after poll shows, are morally opposed to abortion, that our generation, those millennials and even Generation Z, believe there's something morally wrong with abortion. Men and women, I, I reject the lies of mainstream feminism. Mainstream feminism that tells us that we as women must pay somebody to kill the child, our child. That we must seek out violence in order to be equal to men. I believe abortion is and always will be the opposite of empowerment. And it has no place, frankly, in a civil society such as ours. I think it's antithetical to the goals of feminism. If you look at 
feminist history. Yesterday we had the chance, we were driving from New Jersey up to <coughs> New Hampshire, and so we were kind of in the middle of nowhere, so we decided to extend our trip for another hour and a half, and we went and visited uh, the birthplace of Susan B. Anthony in Adams, Massachusetts, and I highly encourage you to go to her, her birthplace, this museum. And we talked a lot at the with the museum curator, uh, folks who've studied uh, first wave feminism. What were these, what were the first wave feminists, what were the basic principles of feminism? The basic principles were nonviolence, equality, understanding that one human should never oppress another or treat another human being like property. In fact, these first wave feminists, majority of them came out of the slavery abolition movement. Leaders like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was the right hand person, partners in crime uh, with Susan B. Anthony, who, who fought for decades in the abolitionist movement. First wave feminists understood that there was something fundamentally wrong with abortion. They understood that profound reality that life began at conception and that the ability to have children was a gift. I have some quotes I just wanted, I, I just pulled up and you, once again, you don't have to really believe me because I'm just an anti-abortion activist, but I went to Google and I just pulled up the first feminists, first wave feminists, suffragists. What did they feel? What did they feel about abortion? And there's, there's an, an ever-ending, never-ending supply. Mary Wollstone Craft, the early British feminist who wrote The Vindication of Rights of, of Woman, who you know, basically kicked off feminist thought, feminist philosophy. She wrote, women becoming consequently weaker in minds and body than they ought to be were one of the grand ends of their being taken into account. That of bearing and nursing children have not sufficient strength to discharge the first duty of a mother and sacrificing to lavishness the parental affection that ennobles instinct. Either destroy the embryo in the <coughs> womb or cast it off with, when born. Nature and everything demands respect and those who violate her laws seldom do without impunity. And Mary Wilson Craft, I mean, she was, she was an egalitarian feminist. She was a revolutionary feminist. She believed that men and women should be educated together and equally. Uh, she did not live a um, traditional female lifestyle uh, at four, 1790s. You can Google that. Um, Elizabeth Kinney Stanton, once again, I mentioned about her role in the slavery ab abolitionist <coughs> movement. She actually became frustrated that the slavery abolitionists wouldn't accept female leadership. Um, she wrote an article in The Revolution. She was the editor of The Revolution, which was Susan B. Anthony's newspaper that they published for at least three years under S uh, Susan B.'s um, leadership. One article she wrote on infanticide, she said, there must be a remedy for such a crying evil as this, but where shall it be found at least begin, if not in a complete enfranchisement and elevation of women. Sarah Norton, uh, she's best known for being the first woman to win admittance to Cornell University. Uh, she, she spoke openly uh, against abortion, openly against, uh, you know, actually there's one article here of, of a husband who had procured a, a, basically a poison <coughs> to feed his wife to try to induce abortion. Spoke openly of his crimes, of not only killing his wife, but killing his, his child of murdering two individuals. Victoria Woodhull, the first woman to run for president in the United States of America. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first female physician. She wrote in her diary about Madame Restel. She was the notorious abortionist in New York City. Dr. Blackwell wrote, the gross perversion and destruction of motherhood by the abortionists filled me with indignation and awakened active antagonism. That the honorable term female physician should be exclusively applied to those women who carried on the shocking trade seemed to me a horror. It was an utter degradation of what might and should become a noble profession for women. Dr. Charlotte Lozier, once again, one of the first female doctors in America, spoke openly. Susan B. Anthony. There's multiple articles, multiple quotes attributed to her uh, when she's talking about child murder. During that print of the revolution, um, Susan B's newspaper, they refused during the entire printing of the newspaper to accept any ads, any ads that promoted abortion. At, at the time, these were very popular in female women's magazines. They would have these natural herbal supplements um, to regulate uh, the menstrual cycle to induce an early abortion. 
and they were very lucrative, lucrative. but the revolution always refused to print them, always refused to uh, stand to make a profit off of the destruction of an unborn child. Alice Paul, the original author of the ERA, um, she aptly said abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. She predicted dead on what would happen with second wave feminism in the 1960s, 1970s. 40 years after the 19th Amendment in 1963 that the second wave of feminism kind of kicked off, the Equal Pay Act made it illegal to pay men and women differently for the same work. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which included provisions prohibiting sex-based hiring and firing and promotion decisions. Betty Friedan's publication of the Feminist Mystique, which in the first edition did not mention contraception and abortion. We looked at the second wave of feminism and what was happening. It was post-war too, and Betty Friedan writing aptly about this restlessness and this unhappiness that women who worked in the home felt. But it was really two men, Larry Lather, an author, and actually the biographer of Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, Bernard Nathanson, an abortionist in New York State, who founded NARAL, the National Association of Repeal of, of Abortion Laws. It was these two men who actually met with B Betty Friedan and convinced her that it was in the interest, the best interest of women in America, to accept abortion, to promote abortion, and merged sexual liberation with the feminist movement. And Bernard Nathanson, in his multiple memoirs that he wrote before his death, he talked about why they did this, why this was an intentional move on their part. Because you see, eugenics was always something that like rich, white, old men would talk about. Eugenics was very popular in New York State. But they realized if, if it was ever going to go anywhere, if they were ever really going to convince people that abortion was something that was good, that something that needed to be done. For example, Larry Ladder was a believer in the impending population bomb. He believed the 1970s was going to bring on this huge population uh, bomb and this crisis, and he believed abortion was a solution to that. But they knew if they ever wanted to succeed, they had to attach it to this growing women's movement. There's a fantastic book written by Sue Ellen Browder uh, called Subverted. I recommend you can get it on Amazon. You can download it. Uh, Sue Ellen was a writer at Cosmopolitan at the time uh, and writes about that 1968 National Organization of Women, that now convention where they actually adopted abortion into their platform and how that happened. So two men convinced Betty Friedan, convinced the second wave feminist movement, second wave feminist leaders, that abortion was somehow needed the abortion was somehow needed for the equality of women in our nation. And today, I have a hard time when I look at today's feminist organizations who they claim that it's not enough, that women, women are being let down in our nation. I'm getting emails every day by now and NARA and Planned Parenthood telling me that my, my rights are under attack, stand up and fight back. And I think we've come a long way. I do believe we have full equality in the law. Now, do I believe that there needs to be more enforcement of current laws? Yes. But I do believe that we have equality under the law in the United States. I actually think if we were serious about expanding quality of women, we would actually focus a lot of our time abroad. But it's not getting airtime of what's happening. American women don't worry about female general mutilation. We don't worry. I don't worry that my daughter's going to be sold uh, to a rapist at 12 to be married. I can walk in front of my husband on the street. I can drive a car. I can get the college degree I want. I can get, get that job that I want. But we're told by today's modern mainstream feminist movement it's not enough that we need more. We need more. We need free contraception in order to be free. Taxpayers have to fund it. We need free abortion in all nine months of pregnancy, and that's the only way that we'll achieve full equality. I think that's wrong. And they've institutionalized this belief everywhere. They've institutionalized it. It's in the words of the abortion worker at Planned Parenthood who told my friend Nally, oh, it's just a 10-minute procedure. It'll be over. Life will go back to normal. It's nothing, it's just a blob of tissue. 
It's in the words of the college administrator who told one of our students, Eleanor, when she became pregnant, well, you can keep your baby, but you're going to lose your housing scholarship, or you can just have an abortion. And like my yeah, this was at a Catholic university in Fordham, where Eleanor literally was faced with being kicked off campus, losing her $10,000 a year housing scholarship, or just going down to Dr. Emily's, the abortion facility in the Bronx, and having an abortion for $400, $350. This is institutionalized everywhere. Like, we don't even try. We don't even try to help women facing an unplanned crisis pregnancy. I would actually argue that the handing down of Roe and Doe has actually made our country, quite, quite frankly, lazy. Because we don't have to help her. We just say, it's your body, your choice. Go ahead and Google it. There's a Planned Parenthood down the street. Planned Parenthood, 79% of them are five miles from a college campus. We don't even have to try to solve the problem. I reject these mainstream lies of feminism. I reject these lies of feminism. And I think that it, this is hard stuff to talk about. Because it's personal, and all of us have had personal experiences with abortion. But this is something we have to discuss. Because if we're really going to be free in our country, if women are going to be free in our country, we have to understand that our fertility is a gift. That being a woman isn't something that we have to mask and cover up. I think the first big lie of feminism, mainstream feminism, that I reject is that it just goes very back to the beginning. It's that myth that sex is without consequence. I know it's controversial. Majority of college students are having sex outside marriage, whatever. I'm not going to talk about the morality of that. But we have to understand and we have to be willing to talk about the fact that sex does actually have consequences. That the CDC has self-proclaimed that we're in the midst of an STD epidemic, that one in two under 25 We'll get at least one STD. You can ask our students for life group at Baldwin Wallace College two weeks ago, who were told by the LGBTQ group, no, you're not allowed to have a table at our sex fair because you're not sex positive. The message you're delivering isn't positive about sex. I would just like to add, pro-lifers tend to have a lot of kids. We're positive about sex. <laughs> but I think it is a real discussion to have that there are consequences. There are consequences. Some are embarrassing, they're a rash, or something you have to go get taken care of, get some antibiotics, whatever. Some are deadly, HPV, HIV. Some come with at least 18 year commitments of raising children. But we have to talk about this is actually a consequence. <laughs> he, he's got headphones on, he's not listening to this part. Every once in a while he'll peek to see what's going on. But these are real consequences that we have, we have to talk about. Because I believe once we said, hey, sex is meaningless, you know, you don't have to be in a committed relationship with this person to have sex, it's just fun. Once we said that, then that second lie of feminism, mainstream feminism, had to come out. And that was contraception is necessary for the advancement of women, right? Because we're not having sex in a committed relationship, attending to create a family, to create a legacy something we do for fun, something we do for pleasure. And if we don't want to acknowledge that consequence, of course, then we have to use contraception. I reject that, that we have to be, be told by mainstream feminism, well, you just need to take these carcinogenic hormonal contraceptives to suppress your body's natural functions, and then you can be equal to men, and then it'll be okay. Men and women are different. We know this biologically. We can start with our brains. We are women. We are way more advanced with those brains. Our neurons connect to the left and, and right hemisphere. We have more neurons connected to those hemispheres. That's why we can multitask. And this is proven science. Look up Steve Rhodes. He's a um, professor at UVA. He writes a lot about the functions of the brain, the differences between male and female biologically, and how, you know, if you're treating a man for a mental disorder and you prescribe certain medication, it actually doesn't have the same effect on women because our brains are literally wired differently. And that's okay. That doesn't make us less equal. 
It just makes us different. We know from the writings of the first wave feminists when they talked about contraception, they opposed it because they actually believed it would lead to the promiscuity of men and husbands. Don't we have that today? A generation of men who use women's bodies and then say, oh, well, just get taken care of. I'm not having that baby. I'm going to go get you $350. That's what we have today. We have women, every time we go to high schools and talk about worth and dignity, as your dignity as a, as a human being, you see the hurt on these girls' faces. Look at the pornography addiction in our country. This is an issue that's not even controversial because left, political left and political right are fighting against this. It's out of control. 18-year-olds having to use Viagra. And we know hormonal contraception. And I'm talking about hormonal contraception, not barrier method contraception. Hormonal contraception, IUD, pill, shot. We know it can act as an abortifacient. It actually tells us that on the package, on the label. We know it can act as an abortifacient, could, could kill an early human <coughs> being. But we also know it doesn't prevent unintended pregnancies, unplanned pregnancies. In fact, this, this summer, there was a study that came out by BPAS, the British Pre Pregnancy Advisory Service. They are the largest abortion vendor in the UK. And this is what was written in the Huffington Post by this new study. The Huffington Post, once again, you don't have to trust me, I'm using secular sources. It turns out over half of women, 51%, who procure abortions do so because of the failure of their contraceptive method. In fact, the study over 60,000 women found that their contraceptive use contributes to a greater likelihood that women will have a later term abortion, 20 weeks or later, because they assume they can't get pregnant using contraception and miss early pregnancy signs as a result. In response to this study, the chief executive of BPAS, now this is the leading abortion vendor in the UK, this is not a pro-lifer, she said, our data shows women cannot control their fertility through contraception alone, even when they're using some of the most effective methods. Family planning is contraception and abortion. Abortion is birth control that women need when their regular method lets them down. It's right from the horse's mouth. Pro-lifers have been saying this for years. Now we have the proof. Contraception doesn't reduce abortion. Contraception's everywhere. You can get free condoms anywhere on a public high school or college campus. But yet abortions continue to happen. It's just a fallacy. Now not even to mention the fact that a hormonal contraception can have really dangerous side effects on our bodies. The Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, funded by the National Cancer Institute, showed that women who use birth control pills could face a minimum of 50% increased risk of developing breast cancer. Birth control pills containing high doses of estrogen, 50 micrograms or more, boosted breast cancer risk nearly threefold, and those that contain moderate dose estrogen, 30 to 35 micrograms, which is the majority of birth control pills on the market right now, increased the chances about 1.6 times researchers found. Can't forget to mention the World Health Organization, which has actually labeled car hormonal contraception as a group on carcinogen. The same category as asbestos and cigarettes. But we don't even talk about this in America. We can't talk about this. Heck, when I talk about it on TV or talk about it on a blog, I get nasty tweets for the weekend. You're fat, shut up, no one will have sex with you. You don't have to worry about contraception. That's the results I get. That's the conversation that we have. We can't even talk about it because it's personal. And many of us women have been prescribed birth control in our lives for sometimes for reasons not even relating <coughs> to having sex, right? We've been on birth control. We can't even talk about it. it's personal, but we can't even talk about these facts. Why is that? I reject the notion that I have to take a group one carcinogen and just a carcinogen in order to be equal to men. I don't have to do that. I don't eat meat. I don't drink milk. Well, I'm paleo now. I don't drink milk in general. But I don't eat meat or drink milk with hormones in it. 
Gunner only drinks half and half. Gunner gets organic half and half. If you want to see my food budget every month, try buying about $500 worth of organic half and half every month. I need my own freaking cow. <laughs> I don't do that. Why would I put these drugs in my body? And why can't we have an honest discussion about these drugs? We try to have an honest discussions and we just get shut down. We get screamed at, we get yelled at, we get called nasty names, I get called fat and ugly, whatever. And so when the contraception fails, which we know it will fail, it's not foolproof, whether it's a barrier method or a hormonal method of birth control, that third lie and that fourth lie of feminism, mainstream feminism, comes up. That's that abortion is needed for women to be equal and that it's safe and it's harmless. You see where I'm going? Sex, anywhere, whoever, for fun, outside community relationship, you have to have birth control because you don't want that intended consequence of something that could actually happen. Then you know birth control will fail and can't fail and you have to have abortion. And I'm not even starting, I mean, I don't think we really need to talk today. We can talk about some probably the question and answer is that we know abortion kills. We know abortion kills a human being. I mean, this is kind of decided science. We've all seen the ultrasounds of our brothers and sisters in the womb. It kills something. It kills a human being. 1995, feminist Naomi Wolf wrote in the New Republic, the statement that abortion stops a beating heart is inconvertibly <laughs> true. Pro-abortion feminist Camille Peglia wrote in Salon, I have always frankly admitted that abortion is murder, the extermination of the powerless by the powerful. We know it kills something. We know it kills a human being. Now the argument we hear today on campuses across the country, the argument we get on social media is, not, is that it's not whether or not it kills a human being, it's whether women have to have abortion in order to be free. Whose rights are more important, her rights or the child's rights? So we have to have legal abortion in order to achieve the life we've always dreamed for ourselves. And rather than truly seeking to serve women, to serve women in that unplanned crisis pregnancy situation, we simply just, like I said, go to Google, go have, go have the abortion, when she seeks that advice from her boyfriend, her friends, and family, all she hears is that mantra, your body, your choice, whatever, I'll respect your choice. And to her, what she hears when she hears that is go have the abortion. I wrote a book um, seven years ago, and we interviewed, we decided to interview students uh, who had become pregnant in college, uh, and who had either chosen to parent, chosen to place for adoption, or had chosen abortion. And one thing that we found in all the interviews that we conducted with the students, the young women who had one person, just one person in their life, who said, you know you don't have to do this. I can help you. They're the women who chose life. It wasn't that the promises were like grandiose, like, hey, I'll pay for everything. I'll watch your baby. It wasn't even like a lot of promises. It was just hey, you realize you don't have to make this decision. Every girl who ended up choosing abortion did so because she couldn't find that person in her life. And I don't even think she realized that. They, they actually talked about in the interview process like, oh, I talked to so-and-so, and then I talked to so-and-so. One young lady talked to like nine different people. I said, why do you call on your friends? And she's like, I don't know. I just didn't know what to do. And I was like, well, they kept telling you to have the abortion. So why didn't you just, she's like, I don't know. I just kept calling. Because all she wanted to hear was you don't have to do it. She just wanted that reassurance. We see this time and time again on campuses where our Students for Life groups have scholarships for pregnant and parenting students. This first school to do this was St. Louis University, and they pioneered this idea, and they gave away a $500 scholarship the first year. And what they found out was they had girls who coming into them saying, you know, I didn't have my abortion because of the scholarship. It's $500 between diapers and formula, babysitting. $500 doesn't really go a long way when you're a parent. <laughs> there you go, there's a parent over there. It doesn't go a long way. But it was just a simple fact that somebody on her campus cared. Somebody on her campus said, we're here to support you. That's all it took to save the life of her child and save her life. <clears throat> I think because we've legalized abortion, because Roe and Doe have legalized abortion in all nine months, we actually haven't had to have these real conversations with each other. We haven't had to say, what do we need to do at Harvard right now to make sure she doesn't feel like abortion is her only choice, abortion is her only option. 
I've been there in front of the Planned Parenthoods. I've been there in front of the abortion facilities on Saturday mornings when the women go in to have an abortion. It's not like they're there exercising some awesome choice. She's not skipping in, singing, smiling. She's often look, looking down. She's sad. She's crying. She looks away from us. And we're just standing there. And even if you talk to her, she'll say, I just can't have my baby right now. She doesn't use the, the terms that Planned Parenthood and now or near will use of, I just can't have this clump of cells. She'll say, I just can't have my baby right now. The fact is, the reason she's there isn't because she feels like she has a choice. She's there because she feels like she has no choice. That it's her life or her child's life. And that's it. That's that we've failed her. That we've failed to have those conversations. That we've failed to create a society to help her through that. We failed her through our own laziness. Maddie Brinkerhoff, one of the first wave feminists, wrote, when a man steals to satisfy hunger, we may safely conclude that there is something wrong with society. So a woman destroys the life of her unborn child, it is evidence that either by education or circumstances, she has been greatly wronged. And now I don't even have to, I mean, I do have to mention, but I shouldn't have to mention all the health risks of abortion. Once again, something very controversial to talk about. Researchers in Finland, now I'm going to say this, I'm using stats from overseas because we don't have good abortion stats in America. Not every state actually has to report their abortions. In California, they commit one of our six abortions. They don't even report their abortion numbers to the CDC. Guttmacher Institute, Planned Parents Research Arm, has to, they guesstimate these numbers. You have to look at stats from overseas in countries where abortion isn't controversial because their governments are actually interested in studying this stuff and we actually have good information. Researchers in Finland have identified a strong statistical association between abortion and suicide in a records-based study. They found that the mean annual suicide rate for all women was 11.3 per 100,000, but the rate for women following abortion was 34.7, three times higher. A suicide rate associated with birth, by contrast, was half the rate of all women, and less than one-sixth the rate of suicide among women who had had abortions. Over 20 studies, linked abortion to increased risk of drug and alcohol use. The lowest incidence rate of PTSD reported following abortion is 1.5%, which would translate to about 600,000 cases here in the United States. Another study found that abortion-induced PTSD, 14% of American women suffer from it. They have symptoms of it. They attribute this to their abortions. Analysis of nearly 15 years of published research and the British Journal of Psychiatry found that women who had undergone an abortion experienced an 81% risk of mental health problems. 81%. 15 years of data. 2003 landmark article, an obstetrical and gynecological survey compiled the results of several studies on abortion. They show that induced abortion increases the risk of placenta previa and later pregnancy by 50% and doubles the risk of preterm birth. We know this for a fact because when we're pregnant, we go into that OB, one of the first questions they ask is how many abortions have you had? How many miscarriages have you had? How many pregnancies have you had? If it didn't matter, why would they need to know? They know this, doctors know this. Placenta previa is life-threatening, might know this. My, do my um, sister, when she was delivering her, uh, my nephew last year, almost died of it. Preterm birth, despite the march of dimes, having a nationwide initiative since the 80s and trying to reduce preterm birth, it's actually only increased in our country. Children who are born, born early have a 38 times greater risk of, of having cerebral palsy, not even to mention educational delays and physical delays throughout their life. Births before 32 weeks, women who give birth before 32 weeks actually double their breast cancer risk. When a woman delays her first full-time pregnancy through abortion, she also increases her risk of developing breast cancer. This is because a first full-term pregnancy, especially before the age of 32, acts as a protective mechanism against breast cancer. A landmark study published in 2014 in Cancer Causes Control concluded that just one abortion increased the risk of breast cancer by 44%. Breast cancer, everyone, we've all had someone in our lives affected by breast cancer. Despite all the research, all the money that's been poured into it, 
Why did the rates continue? For women who had two abortions in the study, the risk rose to 76% and then doubled after three or more abortions. This Chinese study showed a positive link between abortion and breast cancer. It was a meta-analysis, a meta-analysis of 36 studies covering 14 provinces in China, all of which compared the risk of breast cancer among women who had induced abortions and those who did not. This is coming from a country that has no problem forcing women to have abortions that has a population control policy in place. A 2004 Bangladesh study suggested that abortion raised the risk of breast cancer up by 20%. Abortion is not harmless. There are consequences, and this is something we need to talk about in our country. And let me be clear, let me be very clear about this. So we do not need abortion vendors like Planned Parenthood preying on our generation. Planned Parenthood is the nation's largest abortion vendor, right? They have about 650 clinics across the country. Not all of their clinics commit abortions. There are more than 13,000 federally qualified health centers. We call them FQHCs in the government. We like acronyms. FQHCs provide well women care. They provide actual mammograms. They provide care to children and families. If you go to an FQHC and you need care and they don't provide that care you need, they're legally required to transport you to a center who does if you don't have a ride. These are true nonprofits. They don't do lobbying. They don't have PACs. They don't have C4s. Planned Parenthood is one of the largest lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Last year before the election, Cecile Richards, the president of Planned Parenthood, boasted to Rolling Stone, that they were committing more than $30 million to elect Hillary Clinton. More than $30 million. And this is a supposed nonprofit that makes about $150 million profit every year. We don't need Planned Parenthood. We just don't need them. There's been studies done of what would happen if every Planned Parenthood in America would shut down tomorrow. Great thought. If every Planned Parenthood in America was shut down tomorrow, every fairly qualified health center would only need to see two more patients per week to make up the difference. Because FQHCs serve more than 21 million men, women, children. Planned Parenthood is about 1.9, according to their last report. Yet Planned Parenthood receives way more money than fairly qualified health centers. They get more money from the federal government serve less people, and are a political machine. <coughs> you can pull up Planned Parenthood's reports. Once again, you don't have to believe me. Go to Planned Parenthood's website. Their previous annual reports are right there. You'll find that as their government funding has increased over the past 10 years, their good services, those non-abortion services, have actually decreased, while their share of abortion has only increased. Between 2006 and 2015, the number of clients Planned Parenthood served dropped by 19%, while the revenue rose by 30%. Cancer screens, prenatal services were cut in half, but abortion skyrocketed from 289,000 in 2006 to over 328,000 last year. Abortion is down nationally about 12%. And then, once again, those numbers are debated because we don't have great abortion numbers. But we know abortions are only down, they were down by Planned Parenthood 1.6%. <coughs> 2006, Planned Parenthood committed one out of every five abortions. Last year, they committed one out of three, every three. Further proof in Planned Parenthood's abortion machine of feeding this mainstream feminist lie is the abortion quotas. Congressional testimony from former of Planned Parenthood directors have shown us that they actually have sales quotas from their abortions. We've seen the certificates congratulating their, faci their facilities for committing their X number of abortions that they're required to do every month. If they're truly there to help women, serve women, why do they have a sales quota for abortion? Why do they have a sales quota? This spring, Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump made some public statements about how they would like to continue funding Planned Parenthood's good <coughs> services, but they would have to stop committing abortions. And Ivanka Trump, I believe, met with Cecile Richards and proposed, well, why don't you just move the abortion side into another corporation? Cecile Richards tweeted out, PP is proud to provide abortion, a necessary service that's as vital to our mission as birth control and cancer screening. We don't need... Planned Parenthood in our nation. 
We don't need Planned Parenthood preying upon this generation, telling my friends, telling my peers that we have to have abortion in order to be free. That no, you can't do it. No, you can't complete your degree and have your child. No, you can't seek the career you've always wanted to have and still become a parent. So when she does decide to have, have that child, maybe she's had one abortion or two abortions, she got through college, she started her career, she's finally in a place in her life where she feels like she can financially afford to have a baby, everything's going well. That fifth lie of mainstream feminism rears its ugly, ugly head. And it's this. You can have it all, and it's, it's easy. Because we're women, we can do it. I find it, you know, I never really struggled with the issue of abortion. I, you know, when I was younger, I guess I would call myself pro-choice, and then I found out what abortion was, and I understood, wait a minute, I can't be for this. I'm going to show you a video, video in a few minutes of Jocelyn, a friend of mine who had an abortion at Planned Parenthood and how that impacted her. But I never really struggled with some of those mainstream feminism lies, thankfully. But this is the one I struggled with for years. And it's actually the number one question I often get asked by young women who have said, you know, will you mentor me? I'm considering working in a nonprofit field. I want to do this work. It took me a lot of time to overcome this. Because I was always understanding, well, yeah, I'm a woman. Hear me roar. I can do anything, right? I can have it all. I can have a career and I can have my family. And, and yeah, sure, it'll be fine. It's not like they take you aside in school and say, hey, by the way, this is the most difficult thing you'll ever do. I mean, there's certain things I think we need to learn, like how to balance a checkbook and like maybe how to like make food without burning down our house. Um, and we teach the men, too. Uh, but we also need to learn how do we jump. How do we juggle and how do we balance work life and family life? That's something that millennials, especially this generation, is extremely focused on. But this is the lie that took me a long time to realize. I was working 20-hour days when we launched Students for Life. I lived an hour and a half away without traffic, three hours with traffic. So I had two babies at home. I would spend one to two nights a week at an office at a little um, IKEA like mini couch, get a shower at the gym, go home early. I was working insane amount of hours. At the time I had long hair, I tried to curl my hair every day before I cut it off, I realized I can't do that, I needed an extra hour of sleep. Drinking lots of Diet Mountain Dews. <laughs> lots. But I realized, like, wait a minute, I can't, like, something has to give here. No matter how hard I work and how, you know, smart I work, it's, I'm never gonna have it all, it's never gonna be perfect, because there's always a balance. And we know this to be true, but you can't talk about this. There's a, a good book, um, I, I actually just ordered it. I was like kind of reading the Cliff Notes version and watching the videos, so I'm really excited about it. It's Erica Ko Koshmar, and it's called Being There, Why Prioritizi Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. And she just came out with this book, and um, she was doing a bunch of publicity, and, and she's a psychoanalyst, and she's not, I don't think she realized the kind of war she was getting herself into. Um, but she's talking about why it's important for especially mothers to be there those first three years, developmentally for their, ch developmentally for their ch children, and how, how much <coughs> anger she was getting from the mainstream media. She went into an interview with Good Morning America, and then offline the reporter gets angry with her because a lot of these women who are interviewing are mothers and felt like this is an attack. But why can't we talk about this? That Yes, we're needed at home. That raising our children is the biggest legacy we'll leave. And that's important, and that's okay. One of my um, one of my friends, when I started Students for Life, and we started launching our organization, told me, and I didn't really understand at the time I wasn't a mom, but she said, you know, you got to figure out what your balls are. And I was like, okay. And she said, you know, you got glass balls and you got rubber balls, and you're going to have to constantly figure out where are your rubber balls and where are your glass balls, because those rubber balls, you're going to find you're going to have to let something drop, and rubber balls are ones you can drop and you can pick them back up. But those glass balls, when they drop, they're going to shatter. And I constantly, even like two weeks ago, when I realized I had booked myself to travel for five days, and I was only going to be home for like eight hours before I was back on the road for three days, I was like, crap, my balls are messed up again. <laughs> I have to fix them. I constantly struggle with this. I know, probably from the balls are fine. Um, I constantly struggle with this. But this is something we have to talk about. 
that it's not going to be easy. We're actually not going to have it all. But this is important. This is an important conversation. Every choice, like I mentioned with sex, every choice we make has a consequence. And the same thing here. I think we have to understand that our happiness is not found in our autonomy to do what serves ourselves, to do whatever we want. Our happiness is found in our relationship with others and knowing who we are, knowing why we were put on this earth, knowing our mission in life, having those relationships in our lives. That's where happiness comes from. We can have all the money we want. We look at our society today. We're one of the richest nations in the world. People have every car they want, every home they want, every designer bag, every designer outfit, and we're still a nation of completely depressed people. Why is that? Because stuff doesn't buy us happiness. That college degree that I have that's hanging up, that I paid $250 to hang in my basement, I'm really grateful for it, but at the end of the day, it's not what buys me happiness. My relationships bring me the happiness. Greek philosopher said, your freedom, your real freedom, is your power to choose the good. Aristotle said that rational beings seek their ultimate end, happiness, by using their reason to judge what will further the end or discriminate it. Our real freedom is in our ability to love, to give love, to receive love, to serve and to be served. There was an interesting article in foxnews.com, judge me how you want. Um, someone sent to me the other day, and it's written by Suzanne Banker, and she wrote, the feminist worldview is antithetical to love because it focuses itself solely on woman. What she wants, what she desires, what, what, what are her rights? But love can't possibly this be sustained with an attitude like that. I thought that was pretty interesting. So I guess I... Um, you can say I'm a little you know, angry, a little miffed about the lives of mainstream feminists that have been repeating for the past 50 years in our society that sex is without consequences, that birth control and you know, hiding my fertility, masking my fertility is necessary for my equality, that I must pay someone to violently kill the life within me in order to be free, that when I do choose to have a family, it's going to be easy and I can have it all. I'm angry about those lies, those lies that we've been sold. And those of us who are pro-life, those of us who reject the violence of abortion, of the tearing apart of a unique, whole, living, distinct human being, those of us who believe in science, we don't, we're not here to take away choice. We're not here to tell women what to do with their bodies. We're here to say, look, you've been sold a bag of lies. You've been sold a bag of lies. That you don't have to pay someone to dismember another human being in order for you to be free, in order for you to have equality. We are fighting for real choice, for nonviolent health care, nonviolent choices. We do not believe, as Obamacare, as ACA told us, that pregnancy is a disease. That's literally what the Department of Health and Human Services under President Obama labeled pregnancy, a disease. Carrying my four children was not a disease that I had. I reject that. I think we need to understand that sending her off alone to that abortionist and just saying, just take care of it. It's your choice. It'll be over. I think we need to understand that that's not seeking justice for her. The reasons that led her to that abortion facility, whether it's a bad relationship she's in, a toxic relationship, whether it's poverty that she's, tr she's struggling with. We've only prolonged and potentially exacerbated and compounded her struggle through that abortion. We didn't seek to build a real relationship with her. We didn't seek to find a solution to her problems. We just sent her to someone who was profiting off her desperation. It's the pro-life movement, this pro-life generation that advocates for the support that women and families need. We don't believe in just shipping her off to abortionists, and so we have to put our money where our mouth is. That's why we, we fight and struggle. That's why we create pregnant on campus initiatives on colleges across the country. That's why we run pregnancy resource centers, because we realize we have to be there for her. We have to show her that there are people who will love and support her. 
our feminist, um, our pregnant on campus uh, vision, this like very feminist pro woman vision, is something that we do every day on colleges across the country. We are the ones, it's the pro life students who are the ones going to the administration saying, why aren't there diaper changing stations in the bathrooms? Why aren't there lactation rooms on campus? Why is it that when she becomes pregnant, she can no longer live here? Why is it her, the basketball coach, coach is telling her she's going to lose her scholarship? We're the ones who write the letters and force Title IX on the campuses. Why is it that it's just us? Why isn't this everybody? Everybody fighting for this. So do I call myself a feminist like, like I did in high school and college? I don't think so. I don't. I don't really do anymore. I don't, I don't know. I, the title is kind of like, Meh, I don't know if it's worth anything. 20% of American women call themselves a feminist, I, even though about 70% of women, American women identify with the goals of feminism. The label I actually care about is that pro-life label. Is that label that I want people to know and understand that when they hear the word pro-life, it's synonymous with being pro-woman. That we're the ones who want to provide those nonviolent choices for women. That's really the label that I care about. I don't want my, my voice, my story, I don't want that to be co-opted by that mainstream feminist movement that tells women that we have to ingest carcinogenic drugs or kill our child, pay someone else to kill our child in order to be free. So I'm going to play a short video uh, from my friend Jocelyn about her experience at Planned Parenthood, and then you can line up uh, over here and we'll be able to take your questions. I am Jocelyn. I had an abortion in Des Moines, Iowa in 2002. So that morning at seven o'clock in the morning, we entered the Planned Parenthood. We were immediately asked for payment. The other people in the room were crying, they're upset. It's dark, dirty, all of the Furniture is very old and outdated, and the seats were all in a U-shape, so you had no choice but to see everyone else that was sitting there. There was a couple that sat in the corner crying to each other. There was another woman sitting by herself, looked like she had a very rough life. Then it was time for me to go back for my abortion. No one talks to you, no one comforts you, no one explains anything to you. There was no discussion of options. There was no discussion of community resources to help me if I wanted to parent. There was no um, suggestion of adoption. They did an ultrasound. I wondered why, you know, why were they were even doing an ultrasound because I was under the impression that there was no baby there yet. Um, I was very confused and, and did not fully understand the procedure. They said it would be mild cramping. That is the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. They say it only lasts about 10 minutes. It felt like an hour of hell. He didn't talk, he muttered to the other staff. And when he was done, he just left. My partner at the time was bawling. This is a grown man, bawling. Afterwards, we were led to a recovery room, which was just a small room with chairs, armchairs. And they said, after a while, they would check and make sure that our bleeding was okay and then we could just leave. No aftercare, no follow-up. And I didn't, it, it took a while, you know, to, to realize uh, what had happened. And um, I tried to convince myself for a long time that, that it was okay. You'll find that the abortion affects all sorts of areas of your life. It affects the way that you parent your other children. Um, I had a very difficult time bonding with the daughter I already had after my abortion. I had a very difficult time bonding with the child I had after my abortion. Um, I became pregnant right away. Drug use has been a struggle for many years. I don't feel comfortable or trust doctors. I don't feel comfortable even when it's probably needed. I certainly don't seek out dental care specifically because the machines that are used in the dentist office, the suction, the sound of the machines, puts me right back at that day. And uh, I can't, uh, it's, I can't even go to have a cleaning done um, because it's, it's that traumatic. There's absolutely no reason to go to a Planned Parenthood. There are so many community resources now that can help you uh, 
get to a real doctor and receive prenatal care. There are resources to help you financially, spiritually, even if it's just finding a safe home if you're not in a place that's, that's safe. My husband works really hard. He works 40 hours a week and we live paycheck to paycheck. To know that my husband's hard-earned money goes to fund an organization that has destroyed my life and the lives of thousands of women, in addition to destroying children in the womb, is repugnant and it makes me sick. I am a one-issue voter. This has affected my entire life, not just my life, but other members of my family, other women in my family that have had abortions. This has affected our family so broadly, this can't be political anymore. These are people's lives. And I've been voting for pro-life politicians since I've been able to vote, and I need to see action. People are hurting. People's lives are being destroyed. It's time to defund Planned Parenthood. That's a really interesting story of Jocelyn. Um, it was uh, when I first met Jocelyn a few years ago, uh, she um, didn't smile a whole lot. And so we had her on Capitol Hill, and we were meeting with Speaker at the time, Speaker Boehner's staff. And we were talking about defunding Planned Parenthood and abortion experiences at Planned Parenthood. And she actually told the staff, and she didn't say it in this video because uh, I don't think she wants it widely known, but um, she actually showed her tooth, and her tooth was black. And she talked about the fact how she's had multiple, um, multiple uh, issues with her teeth in the past, tooth abscesses. I don't know if you've ever had a tooth abscess. I've had it happen to me twice in like two weeks. It's like the most painful thing I think I've got to deliver a child without anesthetic because um, you kids can't do anything to stop the pain. And she's had these abscesses of, of the teeth, but she can't bring herself to go to a dentist. Um, so she, because those, those machines sound like that suction device. Uh, and this is just one woman with a lasting lasting effects, psychological and physical effects of her abortion. So if you have questions, um, you can come down here um, and ask them. And then what's the rule, Matt? They're going to come down, ask their question, mm -hmm. ask one question, and go back to the back of the line. So to come, yeah, just come down here so we can hear you. You guys can line up if you've got multiple questions. Some steps. They just want to make sure we can hear you for the little face. Today was cute, you guys. I'm in this t shirt and I'm in this room. It's like cute. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, my name is Kimmy. I'm a senior here at Harvard. Um, I'm in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Department here. Um, and my research focus is solely on abortion. Um, I am from Mississippi, very pro-life family, um, very pro-life state. Um, and first of all, I'd like to start off by saying something that will probably surprise you, and that is that I agree with you on many things. Um, and most of my research focuses on the splintering of the feminist movement when it came to the abortion issue. Um, I've been really interested in um, nonprofits such as Feminist for Life because many of the things that you mention I think are fundamentally feminist issues. Uh, when you talk about women, I think one quote that you said that I particularly enjoyed was, um, she isn't there because she feels like she has a choice, she's there because she feels like she has no choice. And I think that a primary thing that all people, not just women, not just feminists, should be doing is really making sure that women have the most choice possible, mm -hmm. that all resources are being provided for pregnant women. Um, my main consideration, and it's really hard to articulate myself in this environment, is I'm interested in why so many pro-life organizations focus on the criminalization and the legalization issue, sure. really centering at this through like a legislative um, sort of idea. Sure. Because as we all can agree, and we, we may like throw very different statistics out, but we can all agree that regardless of legalization, women had abortions. Mm -hmm. Before abortion was legal, uh, women will have abortions if abortion is criminalized. Mm -hmm. um, I think a surprising thing that we also could agree on is that it is in the goals of everyone um, to make sure women are not having to face this choice as, you know, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So why are you marketing events, lies feminists tell, when we mm -hmm. have a lot of shared goals 
that's my first question. Um, and also, why focus so much on the legislative aspect and not the ideological sure. aspect? Yeah, thank you for your question. And you. I think it's great that you said that we, we actually do have a lot to agree on. I think that's what you kind of miss, like when you're debating abortion on TV or this comes up on Twitter, because um, often it's kind of just reduced to like one or two snippets and it becomes very heated, very com becomes very tense. But actually, when you sit down, you discuss this issue with friends or family who disagree with you, you actually find that a lot of us agree uh, on many things. And so thank you for that. So let me address the first question, I'll address the second one, okay? Okay. So um, you can take a seat if you don't want to stand there awkwardly cool. or get back in the question. Okay. Back in line. Okay. So okay. yeah, there you go. Um, so the, get back in the back line. No. Uh, the first thing I would say about why um, why the title of the, the presentation was Lies Feminists Tell, because I think it's something that we need to discuss about the, the lies in mainstream feminism. That, you know, I have a lot of friends who label themselves as pro life feminists, and they were actually mad when they heard the title of my speech of Lies Feminists Tell, because they're like, hey, I'm a feminist, why would you say that? And I was like, I'm not talking about you, but I think when most majority of people hear the word feminist, uh, when you ask a lot of voters what you think when you hear the word feminist, they, they will think of abortion. They will think of birth control. They're going to think of Planned Parenthood. Uh, and that's really why we, why we marketed it that way. Um, one of my friends was like, okay, next time you do this, just say lies, pro-abortion feminist tell. And so <laughs> I'm taking it under consideration. So that's why we call it that. Also, by the way, if you label this talk, come hear another topic, a speech topic by someone who hates abortion. A lot of people tend not to want to listen because there was like, I've made my mind about abortion. Please, I don't want to talk about this ever again. So it also gets you in the room a little bit. <laughs> uh, we're marketers. Uh, but so the second, and I'm being very honest, uh, the um, second question you have, the legality, that's actually hotly debated in the pro-life movement. The pro-life movement, I, I don't think a lot of people who are in the pro-life movement don't understand the kind of the complexity of the pro-life movement. Boy, we are not a monolithic group. Uh, we have over 1,100 groups and students for life, and uh, not we don't always agree on things. Our staff doesn't always agree. We are made up of liberals, conservatives, uh, Christians, atheists. Um, it, we don't always agree on every everything we do or every strategy we take. And that's actually something that's debated a lot in the pro-life movement. Of do, Does the pro-life movement hurt itself by focusing too much on politicians, on legislation? Um, we try to kind of straddle the line students for life. We believe that our organization is, is really truly fighting for cultural impact because we know young people, people in college and high school, uh, they're making up their beliefs about abortion. They're also the ones most targeted by the abortion industry. We want to change their minds about abortion um, because once you change the minds of the youth, of the younger generation, you will change the minds of the country. It's what we did with anti-smoking in the 80s and 90s. You know, I'm a product of that, you know, going to schools with the black lung and kissing someone who smokes is like kissing a frog stickers and all this stuff. The anti-smoking, anti-tobacco lobby didn't really start in Washington, D.C. They started in the schools. Um, and the same thing if you look at the gay marriage uh, movement. They started in Hollywood. They started in the schools. It wasn't until like 2004 when, you know, referendums started happening on the ballots. And so those movements understood that we need to change the culture. We need to change how people think. And that's why we focus so much on young people. I think that, yes, uh, we do, though, need to focus on uh, legislation because um, some people, and a majority of people, sadly, I believe, uh, derive their morality from legality in our country. And I think this is wrong. I think it's extremely dangerous when you look at the history of our nation to derive your morality, what you think is right or wrong, based on the laws at the time. Because we know we've had some pretty bad laws in our country, um, pretty bad Supreme Court cases in our nation. Um, and don't even get me started around the world. So. I do think we have to work to change the laws um, because I think people do equate morality with legality. That you you noticed when you looked at abortion in 1972, a lot of abortions were being committed. 90% of those abortions were being committed by doctors in good standing, and that's based on Planned Parenthood's own research. Um, but the abortion skyrocketed in 1973. You make abortion illegal, abortions will dramatically drop. Babies will be saved. Some women will still go and seek out to have an abortion. Some doctors will still continue uh, to commit abortions. Planned Parenthood already has plans for what happens if Roe and Doe are returned and what the strategy is there. But I, I don't think the fact that some women will still seek out abortions means that we have to make it legal, uh, that it should remain legal. Um, well, that's actually, that's a good point. So. 
Will they die from legal, illegal abortions? Yes, some women will die from illegal abortions. Women today, women today in America die from legal abortions. Cree Irwin died of Planned Parenthood uh, just last year of a legal abortion in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We just had an event in front of the St. Louis Planned Parenthood Mega Center with 67 women <coughs> dressed in white, representing the 67 women who we know have been called via ambulance uh, to be taken to the hospital. And those are the ones that are such emergency situations they can't rush them into a staffer's car. Um, we know women die from legal abortions and they die from illegal abortions. But the simple fact is because women may die from uh, killing a, another human being from procuring illegal abortion doesn't mean that we, we should allow and say that it's illegal to kill a unique, whole, living human being. That's still fundamentally, morally wrong. Question. Sorry, just like oh, you, you, sorry we have to go. I'm doing, yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Roberto. I'm a sophomore here at Harvard. Uh, my question has to do with your views on contraception. Sure. Um, so it seems like contraception is actually a quite effective um, way of stopping abortion. The study that you mentioned, uh, if you read four lines down, mm -hmm. it reads, however, each year, 9 in 100 um, people using the pill, 6 in 100 people using injections, and 1 in, in, um, one in 100 people using a coil will become pregnant. That's opposed to the 85 out of the 85 um, out of 100 people that will become pregnant without any uh, types of contraception. Uh, even if you look here in the U.S., the states that have the highest teenage pregnancy rate, um, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, are all in the South and all have abstinence-only programs where sex education is shunned. So my question to you is, it seems as if, and the research shows, that contraception is a relatively effective way to stop abortion. Why would you then dismiss it uh, as, a way, as a way to to, pop, to actually effectively and show in penal regressions that it's quite effective, and then just dismiss it and not want to have more sexual education? So that pe if people have sex, they will have it safely and then not have to deal with the with with the consequences of it. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, so actually, I would dispute some of those statistics about absence education not being effective. Sexual risk avoidance is highly effective. The Department of Health and Human Services has conducted many studies on SRA training and its effectiveness in, in our country. Um, and so I think that I, I think we fundamentally would disagree on some of those facts because we do know sexual risk avoidance education uh, does work. Um, I Now, you'll notice in my presentation I did talk about barrier method uh, birth control. I mainly talked about hormonal birth control, which I believe is harmful to women's bodies. Um, but I do think that because we have a society that says that sex is without consequence, and I'm not making an argument for marriage, I'm just saying sex is without consequence, sex with outside of a confines of a, a relationship, a, a long-standing relationship, intending uh, to have children, because we have that society, we have to have birth control, and we know that birth control will fail. We always know birth control will fail. So of course, once sex was changed, fundamentally changed, once birth control was introduced as a way to prevent the natural consequences of two heterosexuals having sex, then of course then we had to have abortion because once the birth control fails and we know it fails, then you also have to have abortion. And so I would say, and sure, I would say there. that we don't need contraception. I don't need, I, I reject the fact that Planned Parenthood believes that pumping my body full of carcinogenic drugs gives me equality. I am equal to men. I know that I'm equal to men, and I want to celebrate my fertility. And actually, I can do something with my body that you can't. So I can make the argument that I am superior to your body. So, sorry. Next question. I think, I think you're misunderstanding. What I'm trying to say is what, what's the alternative? You get rid of contraception, sure. right? The alternative is that, not to catch you off, I'm just trying to speed this along because I have a 6 a.m. flight. Uh, the alternative is that when you engage in sexual actions, two heterosexuals engage in sexual actions, you understand the logical consequence of that could be that you create a unique, whole, living human being, and maybe you change your behavior. So you're Next question. Can you, can, you, can you ask a question? 
Right. So you said sex is, you, I'm yeah. saying sex. Oh, that's not my main question. I, I think that may be a reflection of your own personal life. But uh, here, I just kind of like to uh, point out something that I'm not sure you're aware of. Are you familiar with the Texas maternal mortality crisis? I've heard, of, I've heard about the statistics, yeah. Are you familiar with the numbers? You can share them with everyone here. Okay. So a lot of people like to say, well, <coughs> Planned Parenthood is good or Planned Parenthood is bad, ignoring all that qualifying language. I'd like to state some simple facts. In 2010, when Texas got rid of many uh, Planned Parenthood funding programs and other women's health services affiliated with any family planning clinic, well, these were broad umbrella attacks that were meant to prevent them from being pulled by the Supreme Court uh, under the idea that it was you know, an undue burden to seek an abortion, which is, of course, what the Supreme Court said the states are not allowed to do. 2010, we saw a jump of I'm shaking. I don't really like public speaking, I'm not going to lie. But between 2010 and 2011, we saw a 171% increase in maternal mortality in the United States, or in, uh, in Texas. The United States maternal mortality rate is rising, and in Texas, the infant mortality rate is also rising at a consistent rate of 2% every year. Now, you may think this is not a big deal, okay, so small numbers, a little bit of change, you know, it's not a big problem. But the reality is, the maternal mortality rate in Texas is worse than the maternal mortality rate in Iraq. These are not small numbers, these are hundreds of women dying every year. Sure. And this is based on the closure of programs that you say give women less of an option. Sure, so let me ask you, what prenatal services does Planned Parenthood provide to women? But they do screenings and tests. For what? For cancer, for... But how, how does that help women who are pregnant? I'm listing them. Hmm. Would you like to hear them? Or sure, do listen. Okay. So among the lists that they do, let's go through... Oh, well, sorry, it's a long book. But, okay, so they do preventative care for uh, hemorrhages. Let's see. <coughs> Having to scroll through the whole book. The fact is, Planned Parenthood does not provide yes, prenatal services. Do. That's not true. This has been you proven over it. and go over again. Website, you can Actually, see. you can see they've taken off you can their see. website. You are not times. telling the truth when you make no. that statement. No, I actually am telling the truth because it's a live action, a group, a uh, pro-life group called Many Planned Parenthoods, asking what the prenatal services, what the services for pregnant women were inside of Planned Parenthood. And they have on audio recording multiple Planned Parenthoods saying, we don't do that. What are you talking about? In fact, if you look at Planned Parenthood's owning reports, 94% of pregnant women who walk into a Planned Parenthood will receive an abortion. This is in their own annual reports. The statistics I mentioned earlier, their prenatal services have dropped by half. Planned Parenthood doesn't actually provide prenatal services. I went undercover to Planned Parenthood multiple times when I was pregnant with Gunner. I went undercover multiple times with Gunner, and I asked them, every single one of them, what can you help me with? I'm new. My script was, I'm new to town. I'm trying to decide whether or not to have this baby. I don't know if I have enough money. What do you have? They wouldn't even, they couldn't even tell me what prenatal vitamins I should take. At one place, I was like, well, do you have a recommendation on prenatal vitamins or what I should be looking for? No, we don't do that. Do you have a list of OBGYNs? And these are Title 10 government-funded Planned Parenthoods in the state of New Jersey. Do you have a list of OBs in the community if I decide to carry my child to term? No, we don't have that. All they had was abortion. That's it. They didn't even know field development. So they don't provide contraceptives, STD testing, Sure, Plan, Planned Parenthood does do STD really testing and SC treatment. Planned Parenthood does provide contraception. And Planned Parenthood, but those things aren't prenatal services. Those aren't services that and help women who are baby, pregnant. And you have a baby, that baby's gonna have some serious health con That's right. complications. That's right. Would it not be considered part of prenatal care to help make sure that baby is healthy? But Planned Parenthood doesn't provide, provide yes, prenatal do. care. No, they don't. Next question, thank you. Um, so I am someone who very much hates how polarizing this conversation
conversation is. I can't yeah. tell. I was just insulted and said that I wasn't low. If yes. you can tell uh, how I feel about this. I would like to mention um, that you, you're you asking, I think both of you were telling the truth. Um, I, I, I don't in many ways doubt what you're saying about like prenatal care with Planned Parenthood in many ways. Um, but I would like to mention that what's causing the rise in, what, in, in maternal mortality rates is an inaccessibility to abortion, not the lack of care. Meaning in particular, and I know we don't like to talk about these things, um, but I, I, again, I grew up in Mississippi. I grew up in Mississippi with high schoolers, women high schoolers who, I know at least two friends who threw themselves down the stairs in an attempt mm -hmm. to self-abort. I have a friend who drank bleach in high school trying to self-abort with an abstinence-only education. This was all around me, not just in my world. <laughs> That's really scary. We are standing um, really still. Um, Turn the lights. So not just in my fun groups, but with all the women I know in this state. So what's causing the maternal, maternal mortality rises isn't, it's the inaccessibility to abortion. I would actually, I would, is that your question? No, uh, my question is, um, in particular, um, my fundamental issue with this, oh, I think we would actually be on the same side in many ways, is the criminality aspect. I think you could tell by my last question. I think that it's completely insane to criminalize abortion because then women will drink bleach. Like, what kind of society are we living in where women can't, will drink bleach? Like, even if we think this is killing a human Isn't that man. a reflection that we as a society have failed her? That we've Absolutely. said, you have nothing else to do. You have no choice than to put your own life at risk. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have to focus on that. But instead, and I know you mentioned all the differences in the pro-life community, but having studied pro-life organizations for the past three years, which I know is incredibly different than being a president of one. Um, Moonlight falls around for a while. Yeah, when I study them all, most are focused on the legislative aspect. On the aspect. Right. I think we can agree with that. Most are focused on um, providing lots of legislation that has, you know, you've made some dramatic achievements including things like education, so now women who go to get an abortion, you know, have to be provided with different waiting periods in different states, different information, different all of these things that you've worked on. With all that effort we're putting in towards legislation, I don't understand how we're not preventing to where it's all of the sudden sure. this was criminalized. We're still not helping the woman yep. who's drinking bleach. Yep. Okay, can I answer now? Absolutely. Okay. So a couple of things um, I want to address. One, I do think, yes, when you look at the national political organizations, the ones that are on TV, the ones that have the most money, you will say that a lot of them are focused on legislative and politics. But actually, there's more than 3,000 pregnancy resource centers across the country. Those centers raise way more money if combined than all the other national political groups. Those are the centers who are actually trying to provide and to stand in the gap to provide that counseling, to provide that support uh, to women who need it. And that is, I don't think those pregnancy centers are a full solution to what we're going to need the day Roe and Doe a return. And actually, I'm working on a book on this right now of what do we as a pro-life movement need to prepare for that day when there is an abortion. And I think it's something that should keep all of us up at every night. It certainly keeps me up at night of are we ready? If that decision that comes down to the Supreme Court, and I believe it will come down in our lifetime, that overturns Roe and Doe, brings the decision back to the states, will we actually be ready? And I challenge pro-life audiences all the time on this because I don't think we actually talk about it that much. We get more caught up in the fight. Uh, talking about the mortality rate, I think that I'm like right now I was reading this article uh, the other day about m maternal mortality in our country um, and we look at countries like Chile and Ireland who've had made abortion illegal Poland they have some of the best mortality they have the best rates the survivability rates for mothers facing pregnancy abortion doesn't actually if a woman's having a pregnancy complication we can treat her complication I have a lot of OBGYN friends who specialize in highly um, you know high risk cases we don't need abortion somehow killing your child isn't going to prevent uh, women from having um, pregnancy risks and when we talked about there was an article I just saw on Facebook last week about this high uh, mortality rate amongst pregnant black women and no one's talking about this that they're not getting the care early enough in pregnancy not being able to recognize the symptoms of epitomic pregnancy but I think when you look at the CDC stats and the rate of 
cert that was sent before the Supreme Court in 2007 talking about mortality rates. Um, we know from the CDC that we don't actually even have good information on this because we don't actually have accurate reports about abortion. And they, were, they talk about uh, pregnancies and actually, I would, here I'll read this too, it's actually really interesting. Maternal mortality is determined by dividing maternal deaths by live births, not by pregnancies. This will necessarily tend to inflate the mortality rate as many pregnancies and in miscarriages or stillbirth. For example, when a woman dies from epitomic pregnancy, will count as maternal death, but will not count for purposes of live births total. And thus far, a greater number of women will, who survive an epitomic pregnancy will not be counted at all. Women who suffer miscarriages and die from associated complications will likewise be counted as maternal deaths. But neither they nor the vastly larger number of women who survive miscarriages will count towards the baseline, which requires live birth. The abortion mortality rate, by contrast, counts all abortion procedures. Um, and so it goes on and on. It's a fascinating re of, of cert to read about these apples to oranges comparisons uh, that are made about mortality rates. Next question. I have about 10 questions I could ask. Um, Just one, please. Yeah, I, I won't ask 10 questions. And it's kind of interesting. I asked her if we could get coffee because we come from really different backgrounds. I, I've lived in California and Massachusetts. I've always lived in really liberal places. I've come from a very liberal family. But um, in college, kind of begrudgingly, as I um, met people who were pro-life and argued with them a lot and took a class on embryology in my department, I ended up becoming pro-life and kind of like hated that. Um, and But something that I spend a lot of time, I also really like take issue with the focus on the legalization piece um, and wonder, and you touched on this, um, I wonder like what can we actually be doing to um, provide resources and to change culture so that women feel like choosing to have a baby is an actual choice that they have. Um, I, I mean, I have so many friends who have had unplanned pregnancies and many of them have been in the situation where their boyfriends are like, well, I don't want it, get rid of it, you know? And there's, and as soon as they're pregnant, like the seeming source of support that they had like disappears. Um, and so, I know you kind of touched on that, but I think you were also a little bit riled up. So within the um, context of we agree, um, I wonder if you could expand on what you on your comments about what we can do there. Sure, but what what more we can do to make sure no one feels like she has no choice in the killer child? Okay, um, yeah, I mean I think. The pregnancy center movement um, sprang out of kind of necessity that there was really nowhere for her to go if she didn't want to go to the Planned Parenthood. Uh, and now today a lot of pregnancy centers are investing a lot of money and raising a lot of money to bring in ultrasounds, to bring in STD testing, to bring in STD treatments. And these are local nonprofit organizations um, that often lack marketing and, and lack the fundraising skills that they need to be successful. Um, I think one thing we can do and something that we've actually done at Students for Life is we actually promote fairly qualified health centers because these are federally qualified caregivers that have been receiving money for decades uh, from the federal government that most people don't know they exist because they don't have the fancy marketing budget of Planned Parenthood. Uh, they're not competing on Google paying $5 per click for the word abortion. Um, and so one thing the pro-life movement can do is literally just promote other resources that are out there in the community uh, when the pregnancy center doesn't provide the STD treatment or the prenatal care, which some of them do. I think we need to make sure all the pregnancy centers, all those 3,000 pregnancy centers I talked about, they move from just providing material support, emotional support, to also having that actual medical support, that they do have a, a licensed physician on staff, that they have nurses on staff who are able to treat the woman body, mind, and soul. Um, I think we have to do that. I think we have to change our college campuses. We actually have to change the institutions and the way we think about this issue. Because like I said, you know, why is it that a girl who is going to a Catholic university who has a $10,000 housing scholarship is literally told that you have to have the abortion or you, you can't live here? Like, why can't she live in the dorms? 
Another Christian university, I won't mention because I'm speaking and I'm trying to get them to help and cooperate, but another <laughs> university, um, if I say their name, they'll, then they'll never work with me again. But um, this actually, our program was actually inspired by this big Baptist university because, you know, yes, you can still technically remain a student at blank university if you become pregnant, but you have to go before a disciplinary committee. You basically have to wear a scarlet A if you had sex outside marriage where the boy doesn't have to do that. He never has to come forward. In fact, if the couple's smart, he won't do that. So it won't be a mark on his record. It won't be a mark on her record. But she can't live on campus. Why can't she live on campus? I was at another Catholic university. And, and a reason I use religious universities is because often I can get my foot in the door there a lot easier. Um, and they all know I'm coming to, like, guilt trip them. Um, but I was talking to them, and they were like, yeah, well, you know, it's just it's just a legal risk for her to be pregnant, because what happens if she falls down the stairs, or if she goes into, into labor? I'm like, I'm like the most clumsy person I know. Like, I could fall down the stairs and break my neck, and that's also a legal risk, too. We can make sure she can stay in the dorms, at least until she has that child. And I'm sure there are alumni in this town who would host her after. Um, so I think there's real changes in our universities that have to make. What about daycare? A lot of state universities offer reduced cost daycare for their employees. Why don't we offer that to the students as well? Why aren't professors more flexible when it comes to um, class schedules? Uh, you know, why aren't universities more more flexible about allowing mothers and children, and, you know, to bring their children into class? And there was some really cool like. Facebook stories this year of like professors holding babies and saying, yeah, bring your baby to class. Um, you know, we actually have to go in. We had a case a couple months ago where a girl missed her final exam in December because she was, you know, giving birth, giving birth to another human being. And then she was told, well, you, well, you won't qualify for your financial aid. And we were like, what? And all it took was literally one letter from us. And like, we're not lawyers. I mean, we like give lawyers headaches. Like, all we were like, hey, here's something called Title IX, and you can't discriminate against her. And then instantly, she realized she didn't have to quit college if she could stay in school. Um, so it's things like that. But often when we're on campuses and our Students for Life groups have uh, pregnancy resource, Feminists for Life, you mentioned, they developed this thing called pregnancy resource forums of bringing <coughs> left and right pro-choice, pro-life together. And often when you have those events, the pro-abortion side, the pro-choice side doesn't even show up. They don't even want to have that discussion. So I think we have to be serious about it, but we all have to be serious about this discussion. Um, because I know, for example, the pro-life generation, or the pro-life students we work, we're, we're certainly putting our money where our mouth is. Thank you. I have a slightly different question. Uh, I was wondering if you believe there exists such thing as the gender roles, and if so, what are they in our society today? Well, that's a whole nother presentation on <laughs> biology. <laughs> Uh, I do think that there, I mean, I, I don't want to go into like, because this could spur up a whole other discussion. And, uh, this is a pro-life talk. Uh, I do think there are gender roles. I do think there are biological differences between male and female. Um, I do believe children benefit from having a mother and father in their life. Um, we know this uh, because studies tell us so, because science tells us so. Um, and I think that they're complementary, that men and women are complementary to each other. Um, it's not that men do something better than women or women do something better than men, and we have to fight for this battle of the sexes. I believe that we are complementary to each other, and that's the way we were created. So that's a short answer to a very <laughs> long you. question. I just wanted to kind of clear up some of the you know, things we talked about with um, asset allocation with Planned Parenthood. And so I was interested in that, so I, I kind of pulled up a study online um, I just kind of look through their, their annual report sure. and see that they record a spending of about $300,000 on abortions, and I guess specifically abortion procedures. Um, and if you actually look at how all of their assets are allocated, um, you know, expenditure-wise, they're spending about $9 million, I think, um, in the report. I just, I want to know how, how that kind of fits into what you were saying, where they don't really offer other services outside of abortion. Wait, so they do offer, uh, Planned Parenthood does offer other resources besides abortion. They do STD testing, STD treatment, contraception. Um, now they're getting kind of into um, hormone, hormone therapy. Um, so they do offer other services. Uh, the argument that we often hear is, well, 
Planned Parenthood, you know, abortion is 3% of Planned Parenthood's business. Actually, it's 11 to 12% of their business. Uh, we do know, like I said, 94% of pregnant women walk in their doors, uh, will obtain an abortion. Um, and I think when you talk about, like when we talk about asset lo allocation and we talk about uh, federal funding, right? So Hyde Amendment is still in place. The Democratic National Committee has asked for repeal of Hyde. They believe the taxpayers should fund abortion in all nine months of pregnancy. As of right now, the Hyde Amendment is still in place in Washington. So technically, Planned Parenthood's $500 million they receive from us every year, the million dollar, over a million dollars a day they receive from us, is not allowed to be used for abortions. Um, but we call that fungibility because we're still paying for the electricity, we're still paying for the building, we're still paying for the receptionist. Um, and so I don't actually, when you look at those numbers, like what are they spending the, the, the money on abortion on? Um, you know, they don't have to attribute, they don't have a separate building that's like the abortion building that they shuttle you to the abortion building. So they're able to mask those numbers. So I wouldn't actually believe those numbers. And this is an organization that literally dismembers 320,000 human beings every year who has been proven uh, by the U.S. Congress to sell body parts of children who've been aborted for a profit. I've seen the FOIA request, the invoices myself, personally have held them in my hand. So of course they're going to try to do everything they can to mask those numbers in the report. Thank you, next question. Um, so my name is Ebony White. My parents thought my name would be a great oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, freshman year I lived in a building called Gray's, so it was, Perfect. you know, just kind of great. Yeah. Um, and then, so a little bit of background. Um, so my mom is a college advisor in um, back in Michigan, I'm from Michigan, and um, she, and I remember having a very uh, young age having a conversation with her about abortion because she had a couple of different students come in uh, who were pregnant and it really tore her up a lot just seeing what they were going through and, um, and she was one of the few people that did tell them like you didn't have to do an abortion and like that made an impact and she had very much been like, um, and so we had this very early on conversation and what it came down to for me was like the fear of if it's illegal, like will it have a negative impact on people who like would still seek that out? Like, what would you say about trying to find a way to kind of get both people who are pro-life and pro-choice um, to congregate around the idea of providing more services through like revamping Planned Parenthood to be much more mom? Is your mom? <laughs> yeah, it's her. She's been texting me. Yeah. My husband's been texting me too. Yeah. She's like, what are you up to? How He's probably not going? watching the live stream. It's very <laughs> but, um, but like a way to get more people to focus on um, revamping Planned Parenthood, to focus more on prenatal care and more on alternative services, like having sure. OBGYN. Let's like, is there a way we can do that collectively without having it be this huge divisive issue? Sure. Um, thank you for your question, Ebony. I won't forget your name anytime soon. Uh, I think it was a very, it was a very valid question. I actually think that I brought that up earlier with the meeting that Ivanka Trump had with Cecil Richards. I mean, Ivanka Trump is not known to be like a pro-life advocate by any means. And I actually had a great meeting uh, with her office in the White House a couple weeks ago. And the whole, uh, her whole kind of initiative at the White House right now is helping working moms. And so I told her about our prayer on campus, and they're like, "Oh, that's awesome. We didn't know pro-lifers actually believe that." I was like, "Yeah, and let's do this in the workplace too, just like on campuses." Um, and so I thought that that was really interesting when she met with Cecile and kind of made that suggestion of like. Well, like, what if we just funded the good services and you separate out the, you know, the bad service, Planned Parenthood, abortion from Planned Parenthood? And Cecile Richards was like, basically, hell no in her tweet. She was like, Planned Parenthood is provide, provi proud to provide abortion, necessary service that is vital to our mission as birth control or cancer screenings. I was like, that's crazy. You're talking about $500 million on the line and you're tweeting out as president of the organization, hell no to this proposal. Um, and I think that more power to you. If you want to go to work with Planned Parenthood and try to convince them to actually provide that prenatal care, uh, go for it. And I think that would be a worthwhile initiative. However, I'm not going to spend my time working with an organization, like I said, that dismembers 320,000 human beings and try to make them kill a little less. I'm going to focus on making sure my taxpayer dollars don't fund this organization. I'm going to focus on nonviolent health care providers and making sure they provide more. I don't believe an organization uh, that has espoused abortion for, uh, 
let's see, 100 years was last year, Margaret Sanger. So for 60 years as a spouse abortion, I don't believe that this is an organization uh, that can actually be turned around this issue because it's so embedded in their culture um, that this is what they do. And I think that tweet was kind of proof that they're not even willing to have that discussion. But I think you should, like, if you have a relationship with Planned Parenthood, if you know people who work at Planned Parenthood, that's definitely a conversation that you should have uh, with them. But I'm, but I'm personally not going to work uh, to do that. I'm going to work with the nonviolent health care providers. Thank you. I'll stop being in one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the last two questions because it's really tender. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think you can tell that overall I just have an issue with the pro life movement's tactics more sure. than I do their philosophy. I have a I have an issue with some of our tactics too. Um, so. But I am actually interested in your um, comments on the arguments of bodily autonomy. So I'd like sure. to share the quick sort of Tumblr meme that you know constantly when I see it I'm like you know that makes a lot of sense and it says that in this country we respect bodily autonomy even if it could save another person's life. Meaning, um, you go in, you die of a heart attack. If you didn't agree to give away your organs, even though they could save the person right next to you, we respect your bodily autonomy enough to not just cut into your body. Um, so many feminists I know, even those who actually do, believe it or not, there are feminists who do think abortion is morally reprehensible, mm -hmm. um, fundamentally think that we just cannot tell a woman what to do with her body because it's not policeable. Uh, a woman alone in her womb, uh, you can't police her to not take a pill, to not this, it's not policeable, it's not manageable, which is why I don't think it should be in the criminal arena. But I'm interested in particular that argument, even though I know the pro-life, like, there's a body, this is a body, um, it's still, there is an argument concerning bodily autonomy, because that body is inside her body, and I'm just mm -hmm. interested in what you think of that rhetoric. Yeah, and the, the, the quick pro-life response to that is a woman does have a right to do with what she wants with her body, but that right stops when it infringes upon someone else's body. And as you mentioned, that child inside of her, that girl or that little boy, is a unique, whole, living human being with its own <coughs> body. And so your right to do something with your body stops when you're hurting somebody else. Look at the, I'm a very big uh, anti-smoking advocate. Gunner has cystic fibrosis. My daughter has cystic fibrosis. Smoking is deadly. We all know this. It's harmful to children with cystic fibrosis. And there are a lot of laws in our country today that prohibit smoking in front of hospitals, in front of schools, right? We've said, yes, you have, you can, you can smoke, but your right to smoke stops when it actually can hurt somebody else. We've actually already made laws that said your right to your body and to do what you want with your body stops when you start hurting somebody else. And our smoking laws today should prove that. And that's the very quick answer to that argument. We can talk after, too. <laughs> Why don't you just come and hang out with like Students for Life at the March for Life or something? And I'd like to attend that event, but. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. Um, I'll also stop. <laughs> but um, I was wondering, you, you referenced, you know, um, people having higher rates of PTSD. You had a statistic, which I think is a little bit misleading, about 81% of women have mental illness after abortions. But I, I think we have to assume that's not caused, strictly speaking, positive, and that probably women with mental illness are more likely to get abortions in the first place. Um, but... All of that being said, um, I wonder, you know, there are, of course, people in organizations, there's the Sisters for Life, who do a lot to, like, help. They have Project Rachel, where they're helping women who are grieving abortions um, and who have, you know, mm -hmm. ex chosen or been forced into getting an abortion and then, like, regret it afterwards. Um, and I wonder... How, like, what's your thoughts around how the pro-life movement does definitely like um, augment stigma around talking about that when like the irony is that I think on the other side of the issue, the like pro-choice side, where um, it's like, yeah, it was your choice now, isn't it great that you get to like keep doing college or whatever it is that you were doing before as though nothing happened. 
also seems to like really trivialize what is experienced as a lot of by a lot of women is like a really severe trauma, <coughs> not you know a simple medical procedure. And so, but I do think it's like it's tricky to you know be trying to promote an agenda that tries to discourage people from getting abortions, but at the same time try to not like stigmatize and like alienate people who have already had an abortion yep. and are grieving that. Yep. Anyway. Yeah, no, I kind of understand what you're saying. I, yeah. I'm going to try to answer it, and this will be our last question for tonight. I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, the That's a really hard question, uh, and it's actually something that the pro-life movement grapples with a lot, especially the pro-life generation, um, because when we're on campuses, we realize we, we have to speak out about abortion because Planned Parenthood's right there. They're targeting women who are on campuses. Women on campuses are more likely to have abortion because you all are paying tens of thousands of dollars a year to attend Harvard University, the top school you know, in the nation. You know, Getting pregnant is a really big freaking deal. Um, but we have to talk about it. We have to still be able to talk about it. But how, at the same time, you also understand that a large majority of women who are walking around on campuses have already made that decision to have an abortion, who may already be post-abortive. And so we've had issues, once again, I'll pick on Christians again, at Christian universities. George Fox University, I have no problem calling them out in Oregon. Anytime our Students for Life group goes to have a Cemetery of Innocence display, which is crosses or tombstones or baby shoes that represent one child that's been aborted that day or that year, uh, the school will say you can't do that because you're stigmatizing abortion and you're hurting women who've made that choice for abortion. And so you have to find another way to talk about it. And unfortunately, I think we still have to talk about it. We know it's going to hurt. That's why like when we're out on campuses, we train our students. We train the students we work with to recognize uh, the signs of, of post-abortion trauma, how to de-escalate the situation, how to have resources in your back pocket, postcards with helplines. That's why we sidewalk talk 1-800-HELPLINES uh, for women who've had abortions. Because I don't think, and this is something that pro-lifers, and actually I think we're going to be doing a Facebook live webcast for our pro-life students about this in the next month, of how do we talk about abortion? How do we, how do we convey truth, but how do we do it in such a loving way uh, where she knows we still love her, uh, that we care for her, and we're not judging her? Um, and that's hard, and I think sometimes we don't always do the best job of that. And we always, it's something that we always have to evaluate in our activism, in our outreach. How can we do both? A lot of times when I know pro-life groups do more aggressive displays, a graphic image, or sometimes not even imagery, just words. Uh, what they'll do is they'll have women who've had abortions who hold signs and say, I've had an abortion. Uh, I regret it, ask me why. And they always have a post-abortive person there who has gone through counseling who can talk to other post-abortive women and men who are suffering on the campus. So it is very hard, and I, th I thank you for like, kind of thinking this out. It's very hard, like how do you talk about this hard issue, this very personal issue, um, at the same time not further compounding her wounds from her abortion. And, and I think that's the sad reality is we literally live in a nation with wounded men and women walking around who are being told that they should be celebrating the fact that they have abortion, that they believe that there's something wrong with them, that they regret their abortion because all they hear from Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry is that they should just feel relief and they feel like there's something personally wrong with them because they're not ever told you may feel this way. And so that's why we need to have these real conversations. So thank you for that. And thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it.